the topic is um, historicity of the crucifixion. So basically, uh, the, what it is is the idea, the idea that uh, the religious scriptures, for example, the Christian New Testament and such, attest to it, uh, church fathers, and also apparently historians and um, Jewish historians and Romans and all sorts of people corroborate the same story. So the claim that I hear in the park is that the Quran cannot be the word of God because it goes against history, because all of the history attests the crucifixion. So generally, when we speak about history, uh, people tend to think, okay, what is history? People actually don't know what history is. So history is really a method by which we come to know what happened in the past. And normally what happens in the past is something of a probability. So generally, we have two main evidences that we use. One is historiography and the other is archaeology. For our purposes today, there are actually no archaeological evidences for the crucifixion. More primarily, there are historiographic claims for the crucifixion. Here we have E.F. Dawa of Speaker's Corner making the claim that there are no archaeological evidences for the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Within the first three minutes, it is dismissed as something unexistent in order to focus on the historiography of the crucifixion. But anytime Muslims make assertions, then immediately do the Shamji shuffle away from their own claims. It is highly likely their claims are false or maybe hiding information they do not want Christians to be aware of. E.F. Dawa said, quote, There are actually no archaeological evidences for the crucifixion, unquote. Unfortunately for them and other Muslims, here are two archaeological evidences supporting the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. Second, we have what is known as the Alexamenos Graffito. It is a piece of graffiti from near the Palatine Hill in Rome, dated to the 2nd century AD. It depicts a man standing by a crucifixion victim who has a head of a donkey, along with his victim called God. It was apparently drawn to mock and ridicule the faith of a believer who many believe was a Roman soldier who was mocked by his fellow soldiers. The Greek inscription reads, Alexemenos worships his God. It is the earliest known pictorial representation of the crucifixion of Jesus Christ discovered by archaeologists and it supports the biblical narrative of the crucifixion and corroborates with the attestation of early Christian and non-Christian historical sources. But listen to me carefully. They were mocking Christ. I'm not. I'm using this as a piece of evidence to demonstrate he died on a cross. He's definitely God Almighty. There's references from pastors in the second century, Tacitus, a Roman historian, who clearly tell us he's Jewish because he's a stubborn Jew. A stubborn Jewish man who died, and Alex there is worshipping his God. Can we safely say that Jesus is the Messiah and he is God? Absolutely. Not just with the Alexemenos graffiti, but we can use Pliny the Younger, Tacitus, Suetonius, Clement of Rome in the first century, all the men that followed the apostles, we can use the apostles themselves, and especially the Old Testament that predicted a Messiah was coming, and that he would die for our sins, and he would be seen and called the mighty God. Hey, In the next room, archaeologists uncovered a second inscription carved in the wall with a different hand, and that inscription reads, Alex Semenos is faithful. Perhaps this was written by Alex Semenos himself or by someone who witnessed his faithfulness. See Alan Milliard, The First Christians, Archaeologically Invisible, Faith and Thought, October 8, number 45, page 9. If E.F. Dawa was wrong about archaeological evidence, how can we trust him with other evidences? Since E.F. Dawa made false allegations within the first three minutes of a roughly two-hour video, how can we trust anything after those first three minutes? Okay, and what about Tacitus? What was, what was so fantastic about his claim? Or why they bring his name? Again, he's just recording history, or at least what people believed in. He does not make the claim that this is an absolute fact of history that people should then use for a basis of belief. That's right. Cornelius Tacitus was just recording history. That's what historians do. And it is this recorded history that sheds light as to what events took place in the past. Often called the greatest historian of Rome, he is known for two large works, the Annals and the Histories. And as to your question, why is he brought up? It is because his attestation is an early non-Christian source that affirms the biblical narrative 
that Christ was put to death by Pontius Pilate. Moreover, as clearly taught and emphasized in the New Testament, this death was specifically by crucifixion. Notice E.F. Dawa's only objection for accepting Tacitus as a reliable source is due to the absence of preferred phraseology. They wish he would have said things in a certain way in order for his work to be acceptable. But because Tacitus doesn't meet their standards, E.F. Dawa dismisses his work as hearsay. But if we apply the very same standards to Islamic literature, every event recorded in the Ahadith that fails to say, this is an absolute fact of history, must likewise be rejected using E.F. Dawa's preferred criteria. Or in other words, by using this methodology, Muhammad's teachings have now jumped from the frying pan straight into the fire, courtesy of E.F. Dawa. On the contrary, here are three good reasons to accept Tacitus as a reliable source. Number one, Tacitus was known for anti-Christian writing. Number two, Tacitus was careful with data and was a good historian who would not take the word of Christians as he would check sources being he was reporting Roman history. And number three, in books 11 through 16 of the Annals, Tacitus has more sources and evidence for his historical evaluation more than the previous ones. The passage of Jesus Christ is in book 15. With this pointed out, what can we learn from Tacitus's work? Well, number one, Christians are named after their founder, Christus. Number two, Christus died by the death penalty during Emperor Tiberius' reign. And number three, Pontius Pilatus, pure curator, sentenced Christus to death. And as recorded in the Gospels, this death was specifically by crucifixion. So, not only do we have archaeological evidence, but as we just saw, we have early non-Christian sources affirming the crucifixion of Jesus Christ as recorded in the New Testament. And the, the second thing is, what the historians are saying is that uh, this man Jesus was crucified, yet Barabbas, the, the rebel leader, his name was Jesus also. Yes. yes. So from my, my, my perspective, I don't see what's so fantastic about history reporting uh, a rebel leader being crucified by the Romans because that's what the Romans did to rebels. That was that was the punishment for rebels. So, so the idea to extrapolate from this point, the idea that the Romans may have crucified a, a rebel to the idea that this person was the son of God and he was resurrected and all of these things, for me, is bizarre anyway, to be honest with you. But what I wanted to do, I wanted to, uh, because I, I've told you, so many Christians have used these three names as if they, so hopefully now they won't. First, Barabbas means son of a father, not Jesus. Jesus was clearly distinguished from Barabbas and there was no possibility of confusion. All Hamza had to do was finish reading the context and he would have seen in the very next verse, verse 17 of Matthew chapter 27, Barabbas is distinguished from Jesus who is called the Christ. Notice the qualifier with the name of Jesus. Second, he portrays the idea that there is no big deal with Barabbas the rebel being crucified. This was a nice attempt to dumb down the scenario as a typical event that bears no uniqueness. But without any type of evidence to support the probability of the scenario, his allegation is nothing more than an assumption that completely lacks historical evidence, the very thing that E.F. Dawa are asking Christians to provide. Notice the use of double standards. Third, his claim, which assumes that this was nothing more than a typical Roman crucifixion that somehow led to the belief that Barabbas became the Son of God, was resurrected, and led to the invention of one of the world's largest religions, is a textbook definition of a slip slope argument. More so, it makes it clear that Allah is the guilty culprit for starting Christianity if we accept what E.F. Dawa says. Going back to my original point, not only did names bear great meaning during this culture, but the writers of the New Testament provided a detailed account by adding qualifiers to certain names at certain times to distinguish between people who shared common names in order to avoid the confusion Hamza thinks may have took place. But because the New Testament writers were under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, they were 10 steps ahead of Hamza, and by adding qualifiers to certain names, they have anticipated and refuted his claim. So the next question then we're going to think about is, after where were they written, is do the writers call the characters the right thing? 
When we examine the time of Jesus, a study has been done of 3,000 names that people were called back then. Using archaeology, using inscriptions, and an exhaustive study of the area, Jewish names in Palestine were collated. It all began with an academic based in Germany who made a list of these names, and the research is called the Talilam Lexicon of Jewish Names in Late Antiquity, Part 1. But actually, it's fascinating because a scholar called Richard Borkham picked up that piece of research and he thought, wow, we have an exhaustive study of the surviving references to people's names. We can apply that study and look at the New Testament and see whether those gospel writers actually called people the right thing. Is there a tie-up between what people were actually called and between what the gospels say they were called in that particular time frame? So if we were to take male Jewish names in Judea in the first century, this would be the order of popularity according to the academic study. Number one, Simon, two, Joseph, three, Lazarus, four, Judas, five, John, six, Jesus, seven, Ananias. And so it goes on. Now, if you were to take the nine top Jewish male Palestinian names together, Outside of the New Testament, they're 41% of name usage. Inside the New Testament, they're 40%. This is a pattern that shows up over four writers writing five books. We include the Acts of the Apostles as well, the four Gospels and then the Acts, which Luke wrote. And the Gospels reflect this pattern together and individually. Now, it became even more interesting when a study was done of Jewish male names, not in Palestine in the first century, but in Egypt, a few miles away. In Greco-Roman Egypt, there was a Jewish community living there in the first century. And the list of names there, let's read the seven names, um, the most popular names, number one, Eleazar, number two, Sabbateus, number three, Joseph, number four, Dosethius, five, Pappus, six, Ptolemaeus, seven, Samuel. Now, names like Sabbateus, Dosethius, and Pappus are in the top ten Jewish male names in Egypt in the first century, but they're not in the Gospels and they don't sound familiar to us. Why not? Because the Gospels were not written about Jewish people living in Egypt a few miles away. They were written about Jewish people living in Palestine, Judea, Palestine in the first century. But the gospel writers get the right proportions and the right statistical proportion of name usage. They get the right proportion of name, but they also get the right features of names. Now, what's fascinating is that the gospel writers know when to distinguish between a name and when not to bother doing it. And when that name Simon occurs, you see that it's a distinguished name in the text. Jesus had two Simon disciples. One was called Simon Kephas and the other Simon the Zealot. He had dinner with a guy called Simon the Leper. Another guy called Simon of Cyrene carried the cross. Simon Peter stayed in the book of Acts with another guy called Simon the Tanner. And that suggests that we're not getting something fifth, sixth, seventh, hand. We're getting something carefully preserved. The only way you get that kind of detail preserved in that kind of statistically testable way is if you're dealing with high quality eyewitness testimony. I hope Hamza and Ijaz hear what scholar, apologist, and Dr. Amy Oryuwing has to say regarding names mentioned in the New Testament. <laughs> 